I want to continue to speak to you about this journey to eternity. If you'll open your Bibles once again to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 9, the journey to eternity. Uh, recently, uh, Becca and I have been working on some of the deeper projects of our home. Um, I've come to this realization that home ownership, we lived in a parsonage in Florida for almost nine years. Uh, and there were obviously things that went wrong, but it never came to my expense. Um, however, now that we own our own home here in Kentucky, I've come to the conclusion that home ownership is basically just repairing everything that breaks in your household. I've also come to the conclusion that I have four small people in my house that are working against the repairs that I'm making in the house on a regular basis so, or making new projects uh, for us to fix. Um, but either way, um, if you've ever been at my house before, which many of you have, um, if you came up the front stairwell of the house, you will have noticed that they were all falling apart for one thing. And then on top of that, uh, the last step uh, coming up into the porch was probably about 12 inches high. So you had to make a serious hike to get up. It was not code regulated by any means, whatever happened there and when it happened. However, that was remedied last week when Brother Robert Christman came over and built us all new steps out of wood over top of the, the old stairwell. And it's beautiful. The last step is uh, very easy to come up above, and uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing. But one of the things that we had to do in the preparation for the spring or whatever for this renovation to happen on the front sto uh, porch was these bushes uh, that were on either side of the stairwell. My neighbor, I asked her one day how long those bushes had been there. She said since the house was built in 1988 or in 1989. For almost 30 years, they'd been in, in, in the, the ground, and they're old, and they're overgrown, and they were huge. And I thought there's only two things I could basically do. I can rip them out and get rid of them, or I can hack them back all the way to the trunk or to the root and uh, see what happens in the fallout if they'll come back or not. And so I decided rather than rip them out, I would hack them back, maybe save a dollar or two uh, to see how that all works out. And so I hacked them back. I mean, down to the trunk, there was nothing left green on them. And I just waited since the beginning of spring. I'm waiting and watching to see if these bushes were going to come back. And about the time that Robert was over there building the steps, I walked out and watched those bushes, looking at those bushes, I noticed that they had begun to spring back to life from all the rains recently. And there's shoots coming out of them, and they look like they're going to make it through the shock of hacking them back that I put them through. This is exactly the story of Isaiah 11. This is exactly what the issue of Israel was. The dynasty, the kingdom, if you will, was hacked back to the stump. But Isaiah says from the stump or from the root of Jesse, there will be a new shoot that springs forth. And that will be the life and the eternal uh, creation, if you will, of the kingdom lasting forever. And there's a sort of pulse that the uh, Israeli community would go through, the Jewish people, that they would wake up and wait and watch and say, is this the day that the Messiah is coming? Is this the day? That we will see the redemption of Israel. And it was a pulse that went through that community as they waited and as they watched for God to do something great in their midst of a branch that would last forever. So let's enter the text today. Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 through 9. It reads like this. It says this, Then a shoot will spring from the stem of Jesse, and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord and he will not judge by what his eyes see nor make a decision by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. And he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and his breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt around his loins, and the faithfulness will be the belt around his waist. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf with the young lion, and the fatling and the little boy will lead them. I'm not talking about the little boy being the fatling, but the calf being the fatling. You know what I'm talking about. Also the cow will bear with, and, and the bear will graze, and their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. And the nursing child will play by the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child 
will put his hand on the vipers then, and they will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth. Listen, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Not that long ago, I believe it was this past winter, we had been missionaries to the Middle Eastern world. And uh, just a phenomenal couple. Uh, used to be pastors here in Kentucky for a very long time. But uh, Kevin had gotten sick that morning and wasn't able to preach. So Kathy came and uh, she preached that morning. Wasn't ready or prepared necessarily. But the Lord gave her the word for that morning. And I'm telling you, it was powerful that day. Kathy, I believe she was standing right about here. And she said that she had a vision that morning. And the vision was this, that there was this tree kind of in the center of the building. And it was a big tree, and it was very round, and it was tall. However, it had no, uh, you know, green on it. It had uh, basically kind of looked like cut off on the, the, the edges of it or whatnot. No green, no flower, no fruit, anything like that. However, everybody, she said, was looking at the tree and saying, why isn't it bearing fruit? Why isn't it flowering? Why doesn't it have leaves on it? And she said what everybody else was looking at the uh, trunk of the tree and things like that, she said she walked over and she looked down and she could see the roots of the tree going deep, deep into the ground. Nobody saw that. And she said then all of a sudden she looked at the rest of the tree and it began to flower and it began to fruit and there were leaves on the tree and it looked like there was life. And I believe that this word was specifically for our church, much like Isaiah chapter 11 was for the nation of Israel at that time. That we will see from this roots and from this tree that looked unfruitful for many years, we are beginning to see the fruit that God is producing in our church. I believe that we're seeing the community involvement, we're seeing uh, the outreach happen, and that God is going to bring forth a great harvest for our church in the future, a new harvest, if you will, in the future. This is exactly the pulse or the idea that Isaiah was waiting upon, waiting to see from those roots the great fruit that he desired for the kingdom of God, a fruit that would last forever, a fruit that would bear forth and change lives. So this poem of Isaiah is so rich in theology. It describes the possibility of a revival and the nation that has old deep roots. The shoot will spring up from the stem, or better translated, the stump of Jesse, the King Father's uh, David, King David's father. And at the point in time, it was easy for us to see the Davidic kingdom being cut off and down low to the ground, and the stump needed new life. And everybody was waiting to see something come forth from something that was obviously looking dead. And this was uh, what we must remember. is is that the scripture begins with uh, talking about this new life that comes from the stump that looks dead. But it turns once from there to the gifts and the attribute and the acts of God. Remember the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, uh, the spirit of uh, the Lord basically being upon them. The spirit of God working to revive Uh, His people. And, you know, this is the idea, basically. It's only by the Spirit of God that makes the revival of a nation or the revival of any people group uh, possible in the first place. I mean, we can labor all day long and hope and pray that God would do something great. But unless the Spirit of the Lord is upon us, then we're we're just spinning our wheels. It's hay, it's wood, it's stubble, however you want to say it. All of the attributes listed of this new branch of the root make the kingdom possible through the Spirit of God. Nothing in this life is lasting unless the Spirit of God is the one providing the means to make it happen in the first place. And the centerpiece, if you will, of this whole passage is the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. This is what we cannot forget. We remember that the vision of Isaiah, it sees, if you will, the Achilles heel of the nation of Israel. It was always that they had lack of knowledge. Always that they forgot, basically. Deuteronomy 8.19 warns the nation of Israel like this. It says, I warn you today that if you forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, and if you serve them and you bow down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. God warned the nation of Israel. He told them explicitly, this is what will happen if you serve other gods. 
In Genesis, they discover God. Exodus, they learn to trust God. In Leviticus, they come to the knowledge of God. Deuteronomy, they're told never forget God. Just uh, Joshua, they remember the Lord. But then in Judges chapter 8, verse 34, it says this, Thus the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God. You see the problem. You see the Achilles heel of the nation of Israel. The flaw, the final flaw in their character is is that they forget and the Davidic kingdom is cut off like a stump. But God says, I'm not done with you. I've got a new kingdom that I'm going to make everlasting on earth. And all my prayer is for you is, is that on your journey to eternity, do not let your memory be your fatal flaw. Remember your journey past. Remember what God has done for you in the past. Remember what the church has done for you. Remember what the Spirit of God has done for you in the past. And remember that the journey ahead is a great one. Picture in your mind, if you will, the wolf laying with the lamb. The new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. A new place to live where there is the tree of life growing forever. And I think that in some ways that Kathy's vision for our church of that tree giving forth life It's like a tree of life for us, a tree of life for Frankfurt and Lawrenceburg, that we can be, that there is a tree of life growing here. And from it, the scripture says in Revelation, there is a river flowing out from the tree of life into the community. God's tree of life, God's life is always missional. It's always going forth and doing something great. I think that something deep happens inside our hearts when we remember God. For Israel, when they remembered God, it was the best times of their history when they remembered the Lord. There are seven historical revivals that happened in the nation of Israel, if you do well to remember them. And they always happened with the beginning of this, that somebody turned their heart back to the Lord. Somebody acknowledged God. They had the knowledge of God on them. Remember, it was Moses, and then Asa, and then Jehoshaphat, and then Hezekiah, Josiah, and then Ezra and Nehemiah. Every time, the story tells us is the same thing, that God has not changed. However, what has changed is the human heart's acknowledgement of God. And then revival sweeps through the country, and we are awakened to the knowledge of God and we are a, a, a revived or awakened by the Spirit. Um, you see this picture of trans, uh, pastoral tranquility or whatnot of lions and wolves and uh, all these animals dwelling together, all of creation itself, the animal kingdom, being at peace with one another, uh, had great roots in the understanding. This was a real issue during the days of Isaiah. And we do well to remember a young David because this was exact situation that David was. If you remember, David was a shepherd of the youngest of his family. Uh, in, in that particular time period, there would be a village and then a young boy or even at times a young girl would take the domesticated flocks or domesticated animals of that particular village and they would be the village herder. And they would take them out into the countryside and they would feed them and water them during the day out in the pastures and then at evening time they would bring them back. But remember what David encountered. Remember the, da- the dangers that he encountered. Because when David came to King Saul and said, I can take out this Philistine, remember? I can take this dude out. What did he say? He said, your servant has killed both the bear and the lion. When did he do that? When he was out pasturing these flocks. When he was out uh, uh, watching over them. And he says, listen, I will make this Philistine like that bear and like that lion. Because God delivered me from the hand of the lion, from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. And he will rescue us from the hand of this overgrown Philistine too. And this is the beauty of his kingdom. This is that his kingdom there is peace. His kingdom there is deliverance from all evils, from all wiles, from all uh, strategies, if you will, of the enemy. He will deliver us from the hand of the enemy too. In this day, in this time, in our hearts, and in the future, ultimately, its kingdoms come in its fullness. But now this new kingdom of Isaiah, uh, he describes, is where toddlers and babies are out leading the shepherds of the field. They're the ones out there because they're not afraid of the lion or the bear, the cobra or any snakes or anything like that. They're not afraid of them because they offer no harm to the people, no threat. 
I mean, listen to this. Government spend, you can solve in one moment by the kingdom of God all the economic troubles of the world. If you get all the governments of the world to stop spending money on protecting their kingdoms. All military efforts, all war efforts, all threats, all technology that goes into that, making nuclear weapons and bombs and everything else like that. You cut all that spending instantly, you can solve all the economic problems of the world. That's the truth. But it's only able to happen in the kingdom of God. Where there is no threat of violence or anything else, it happens in the kingdom of God. When the prince of peace is sitting on the eternal throne forever on earth and so you see that within this image of the kingdom of god where the most ferocious animals look like child things i mean imagine a world where all bears look like yogi bear and boo boo you know what i mean their only concern is a picnic basket you know what i'm saying Imagine a world where Judy Garland is not afraid of lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my! And lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my! That's no longer a fear. And they're not afraid. That's the kingdom of God. Imagine a world where massive, ferocious lions look like Hello Kitty. A little backpack on or something like that. Or some type of domestic feline to children. The other day we saw this actually happening. And I tried to imagine it in a different context, if you will. We went down to the Christman farm, Ryan and Kim's farm. And uh, she has her new ducklings. I think you ordered them in the mail. Is that right? Mail order ducklings. And uh, they have all new chickens and turkeys and things like that. And the kids wanted to see the, all the new babies. And they went down there and they're holding them and petting them. And they had a great time. I don't know about the ducks, though. They may not have had a great time. At one point in time, they told me that uh, Kim and Becca had to pry loose from, you know, Wilson's little eight-month-old baby strength hands. You know what I'm talking about? How in the world do those little babies have much strength and grip in those little hands? I mean, she, they had to pry it, like distract Wilson and then pry that poor little duckling out of his hand so he didn't like, squish it to death. Now, that's one thing for a little eight-month-old baby to squish a duckling could imagine An eight-month-old baby squishing a cobra. No harm, no threat, no strike, no snake charmers needed. Just the peaceable kingdom of God. That's what he describes. No scorpions, no no reptiles that, that would be against us, no fangs, no strikes, no coils, no cobras that are a worry in this kingdom where all the cosmos are at peace with God and humanity. Yesterday, we were in northern Kentucky cleaning out my great aunt's basement. Uh, it was an interesting time. There was lots of uh, taxidermy of mice and things like that. It just happened. You know what I mean? You open a drawer, and there were ten dead mice in there and whatnot. I thought we could sell them or something like that, you know, for mouse taxidermy, but I don't think they're worth anything. But uh, this basement, it was like old, old stuff, you know what I mean, musty, everything was nasty and old. Everything that we took out of that basement had a spider in it. It was somebody's home, you know what I mean. You know, there's two main fears, if you will, of spiders, if you just don't like spiders. It's one of my fears, if you will. I just don't like the fact that they have eight legs and they could be crawling on you and you not knowing it. You know what I'm saying? But there's two main spiders that can hurt you, a black widow and a brown recluse. Twice I was bit in Texas. That stupid state. Uh, But anyway, twice I was bit by a brown recluse in, in Texas. Those are certain fears that everybody has of a poisonous spider, of a spider getting in with your children or hurting your children. Imagine, if you will, little Miss Hubbard, you know, sitting in her cupboard or whatnot and not being afraid of a spider. Imagine a kingdom where there is no fear, where there is no worry, where there are no tears to be crying because everything is at peace. Now, Paul the Apostle is not the only one. I mentioned it last week that Paul the Apostle talked about God being all in all in this new kingdom. And he quotes Isaiah chapter uh, 11 in, I believe it was Romans chapter 15. This new image of the peaceable kingdom of God, Habakkuk also uses this image. He says this in Habakkuk 2.14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
Habakkuk chapter 2, if you go home and read it tonight, I think you'd do well to read it. Um, He depicts this world in this obvious and constant turmoil. He says drunkenness and exposure of nakedness are normal things. People are trying to get people drunk so they will, for the purpose, expose their nakedness. Maybe you've been in a situation like that. Our Our culture certainly is. I mean, it glorifies that behavior. The United States is the uh, capital, if you will, of the porn industry in the West. Millions, billions, trillions of dollars spent on this industry, spent on the alcohol industries that's glorified in our culture. This is where we are right now. And they're fuddled and they're, uh, uh, they're dismayed by the very fact that it's their addictions, wine and wealth, that are messing up their culture. All of these injustices that we see in our culture, not least of these being the unborn that are murdered daily in the United States and worldwide. Not the least of these, the human trafficking of women and children that happen all over the United States, all over the world. This is the injustices that are happening that Habakkuk is talking about. However, right in the middle of it, Habakkuk in verse 14 interjects this. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. He's saying it won't always be like this. And we do well to remember that though the kingdoms of this world have all their issues that we don't necessarily take part in. However, when they happen, we should know that we are workers of the kingdom of God working to reverse the earth's dismay and bring heaven on earth. To prepare a way, if you will, for the kingdom of God to come from heaven to earth. Have you ever been holding a ladder and uh, whoever was working on the ladder above you just happens to drop something on you? You know, I've done this multiple times with my brother and I'm never actually sure if it was an accident or not. He just decided to drop something on my head. Holding the ladder and then all of a sudden a drill hits you in the head or some type of piece of wood or whatever he's working on above you hits you in the head. I mean, this is the reality of the kingdom of God, is is that there will be some people that are constantly looking up and waiting and watching for God, for heaven to come out of earth, you know, or I mean the new kingdom of God to come down, the new Jerusalem to set foot on earth. And they're waiting and watching for the arrival of the kingdom of God. But there will always be other people that are not paying any attention, that are looking, they're distracted by things like Habakkuk talks about. They're distracted And they're not watching for the kingdom of God. And then it hits them in the head. There's two ways that you can receive the kingdom, I believe. One is that it can land on your head. And the other way is that you can open up your arms wide and receive the kingdom into your hearts. Receive the kingdom into this world. So let's be the people that open our hands wide to the kingdom of God and receive it in. And I think that if there is this issue of the Western world, it's as David Wells says in a recent book... (laughs) That we have an idolatry of self in the Western world. We've elevated ourselves above God so that whatever pleases me, whatever makes me happy, becomes the most chief and highest goal of human nature. You see the problem with that, obviously. My political science teacher uh, uh, from high school recently texted me. I do still keep up with my political science teacher uh, from Campbell County High School. And he texted me an article the other day uh, about this specific issue, I think, about the idolatry of self. Uh, my political science teacher was also my wrestling coach, and he was also the drummer in our worship band. So we, you know, it's a small town. We stay together pretty, you know, we, we talk a lot. And uh, this particular article was about a study recently done by the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill of 551 Christians. It was political. It was, he's a political science teacher, so he wanted to address this issue. He says that there were liberal Christians, uh, cons- you know, liberal as far as politically liberal, as well as uh, uh, conservatively uh, uh, based politically. And they said of these two groups that they surveyed, of the 551 Christians, they found that the conclusion of both groups is this is how they viewed the image of God, the invisible God, was a young white guy um, that was somewhat feminine in nature, and uh, the conservatives viewed him as more powerful. Uh, the uh, liberals viewed him more as uh, uh, loving and forgiving and things like that. And uh, the basis of it was this, is, is that uh, it was a clean-cut white guy that basically looked like somebody out of the 1980s boy band. That's what they viewed God as. 
A 1980, I mean, if you have trouble with that image, just remember Ryan in the 1980s. I mean, that would have been basically what a 1980, he would look like he was right out of a boy band. You even had long hair at that time. Perfect. Mullet. (laughs) Imagine a world where God looks like Ryan. Oh, God, we need help, right? (laughs) Do you see the problem? This is basically what the uh, professor, Kurt Gray, who was over the study, said this. The study revealed people tend to believe in a God that looks like them. That is called, in my opinion, the idolatry of self. That we are elevating us so that we become God. The problem is, is with the scriptures is, is that we, uh, we don't have the image of God. Uh, or the image of God is not on God. Of us is on God. But the image of God is on us. We look like God, not the other way around. Does that make sense? We're supposed to be conformed and changed and moved into the image of God because our image has been distorted by sin now. And this is this idolatry, I think. And the idolatry of self, in my opinion, the antidote for it would be this. That you would remember that if there is a kingdom, if there is the kingdom of God, then certainly there is a king. And if there is a king, then there are servants of that kingdom. And by sure, we are the servants and not the king. We are servants of the kingdom of God. It humbles us. It keeps us in a position where we are continually serving God rather than asking to be served by God. Does that make sense? In the book, The Pilgrim's Progress, which I've been reading, if you haven't picked up a copy yet, you need to get it. It's phenomenal. Uh, In one of the particular journeys of Christian, he meets these two young boys. One is named Passion and the other is named Patience. And uh, he's brought into this room with interpreter, and there's passion and patience. And they're sitting in chairs, and uh, passion is extremely discontent. I imagine him to be crying or weeping or frustrated or fidgeting or whatnot. However, the young boy, patience, is sitting there, just seems to be content, just sitting in the chair and watching what's happening. And so uh, passion sits there, and he's distraught. However, then immediately comes in a man who has a bag of treasures. And he lays them at the feet of passion. And passion takes the treasures out and he begins to use them and hold them and and keep them. And he's extremely overjoyed at that moment. However, as Christian watched this uh, unfold, if you will, he realizes that it's not long after that that passion has squandered all of his riches and is only left with rags. And then we see patience. And he notices as he looks in patience that patience is patient, if you will, because he knows that the treasures of next year are better than the treasures of this year. The treasures of the next life are better than the treasures of this life. I think what we need to understand that in the Christian journey, in our journey to eternity, that our passions should be reversed with patience, that we should live lives of patience. And passion, not for the things of this world, but passion for the kingdom of God, knowing that the treasures of this earth will go away. But the treasures of next year, the treasures of the next life will last forever. I think that keeps you in this servanthood, in this humble personality of the kingdom of God, an antidote, if you will, of idolatry itself. And every early Christian, if you will, was not as interested in life after death as much as we are in our society, in our contemporary society. I mean, we have lots of books, even in Christianity, uh, um, about life after death or what heaven looks like or journey to heaven or 90 minutes in heaven or, uh, uh, you know, there's a there's probably a myriad of books just about heaven necessarily. Uh, however, early Christians in the first century were not very concerned about what heaven looked like necessarily. Their concentration was not on life after death, but it was necessarily on life after life after death. If you will, there was this two-stage resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he was in the grave and then he was risen from the dead in a resurrected body. 
And so the early church was concerned primarily not with where Jesus was uh, during that time. However, that seems to predominate our society, what happens when the in-between or when you're in a grave. But the early Christian society was concerned about what happens when you get your resurrected body. That's the nature of what we need to be concerned about. It's life after, life after death. And the way that uh, uh, one theologian puts it is this, is that heaven is simply a wayside inn on your journey towards eternity. The, the ultimate goal is not to go to heaven, but the ultimate goal is to have a resurrected body and to live in a new kingdom that has come down out of heaven and upon earth. And that needs to be our focus. That needs to be our concentration when we will have everything become new, a new kingdom, new bodies. John Polkinghorne, a British Polkinghorne, a British scientist, says it like this, that God will download our software onto his hardware until a time that he gives us new hardware to run the old software once again. It's a brilliant, really, illustration, I think. The idea is is that you are getting an upgrade, (laughs) that you are getting new hardware soon. (laughs) And it's not an iPhone. It's not a new computer. It's not a new Apple or a Mac. It is the newness of a whole body that has changed, and it is only fit for the kingdom of God. One that doesn't wear out, doesn't get old. Keep your mind and your concentration on that new body, on that new kingdom, and do everything that you possibly can in this life to see the newness of the kingdom of God come from heaven to earth. I mean, the world speaks to us that we are sharing in the resurrected life of Easter's resurrected Christ. Yet at the same time, we also experience this present reality uh, that we do not fully rule over creation like we will in the end of time. The weeds in your yard and the weeds in my yard are this constant reminder of the fact that I am trying and working to subdue creation so that I can create and do what God desires us to do, uh, subdue, if you will, creation itself and order it. Yet constantly there's these dandelions growing up around the edges of my yard. Constantly there's these, how do you get rid of brown patches? In the middle of your yard. I can't figure this out. I fertilize my yard. I weed and feed my yard. And all of a sudden I put too much fertilizer on it. And I burn spots of my yard. And now i got a hole there. Isn't this frustrating? I mean, doesn't, in some ways, doesn't creation frustrate you? You buy a brand new car, it starts to rust. You get a brand new house, it starts to fall apart. Pipes break. Things get old, things wear out, we constantly try to renew them. Imagine a day when nothing will be needed to renew. Imagine a day when you can cultivate and create with God, and it will stay that way. When things don't wear out, when things don't get old, when the second law of thermodynamics says that heat dissipates uh, as it gets further in time from its object, its original source, that won't happen. It's reversed. Things stop sagging. Things stop getting old. I mean, imagine a day like that. (laughs) The kingdom of God has changed everything, everything in life. Paul speaks to it like this. He says it's a groaning of creation in us ourselves that we groan inwardly waiting for the fullness of our redemption i mean imagine waking up in the morning and at the light's brightness that you don't blink your eyes five six ten times that you don't constantly hit the snooze button over and over and over again because you're tired and you don't want to get out of bed and you don't groan when you get up from your bed imagine a kingdom like that imagine a kingdom where the groaning stops because You are fully redeemed, fully changed with a new body and living in a new kingdom. The question I think becomes at this point when we turn to application is this. How do we live in light of the resurrection and the end of time? Now that we've traveled around, I think, basically full circle of the journey itself, what are we doing to bring about the kingdom? Early Pentecostals believed this. They, this is how they answered that question, basically. They would read the scriptures and they say, what does it say and what do we do? What does it say and what do we do? 
So that's the question. What do we do about this? For this, we look, I think, to the book of Acts, the concern with the early Christian community. The primary goal was to spread the knowledge of God and his love, his mercy, and his justice. And the issue becomes that what you do in this life will have an impact on eternity. What you do in this life will have an impact on eternity. And the journey becomes being loved by God and loving others like God loves you. And God has somehow made us responsible, if you will, to usher in his new kingdom and the knowledge of God, to spread the knowledge of God all throughout the earth, to bring about heaven on earth. If you would, imagine in your mind, image in your mind what heaven looks like, and then work voraciously with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, to bring about heaven on earth. Introduce the heaven in your heart to earth here and now. And work everything that you can to transform what the earth looks like now, what the community looks like now, to look more like the community of Jesus Christ. This is what you've seen in every revival throughout time, is heaven comes on earth and makes earth look more like heaven. People are revived in their thought patterns and their devotion towards God. The community becomes to peace. Things begin to happen uh, only that the Spirit of God can do. Uh, Worship team, can you come? So the book of Acts, I think, shows this in the contemporary movements of the church. And the kingdom of God comes, and this is what it looks like. Basically, using that metaphor, this is what the kingdom of God looks like as it's coming down the road to earth. Remember in Acts chapter 16 that Paul the apostle is out with Silas. And there's this uh, young girl that's traveling about, that's following Paul, and uh, he casts the demon out of her because she had this strange gift of prophecy that she could foretell the future. And what happens is, is they get extremely upset because it's their economic gain that this young girl is able to tell the future. Any time that you have the Spirit of God and somebody's economic ventures hit together, you're going to have fireworks, okay? And so what happens is is Paul casts out the demon from this girl, and she can no longer tell the future like she used to and use whatever spirit of divination that was in her causing this. And so what happens from there is is that they uh, call the magistrates and and the townspeople. They put Paul and Silas in jail. They beat them. And then, of course, you know the story all along about a midnight hour. What happens? They're singing psalms, and they're praising God in the jail. There's an earthquake, and then the jail begins to open. The doors are wide open. The prisoners are all uh, ready to figure out what's going to happen. The jailer, we see this intervention of the kingdom of God happen as the jailer is getting ready to commit suicide. Because what would have happened in the Roman world if prisoners had escaped, they would not only kill you, but they would kill your family too. That's what was happening. That was his fate. So he says, okay, I'm going to commit suicide. However, Paul and Silas come to him and they stop him. They don't just stop him, but they convert him. They don't just convert him, but they convert the whole household. And then that very night, the whole household is baptized in the name of Jesus. And then after that, you know what they do? They go to the house and they have dinner because that's what good Christians do. They eat together. (laughs) That's about all we do, right? But you see the miraculous change of the kingdom of God coming from heaven to earth as it's coming down the road. Paul was clear to the magistrates. He said, you have beaten me with injustice, and I deserve apology. And he got that apology from the guys that were in charge because they were Roman citizens. And I think what you see is is that prayer and testimony, which is what Paul were giving, preaching of the gospel, brings healing and hope to people, but often the result of it is a challenge in the economic and political structure at some level or another in the world. And Paul made no bones about the injustice of the beating to the magistrates, and the results were this, that there was friction between the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God, as the kingdom of man was being displaced so that the kingdom of God could come on earth. When the kingdom of God comes, the kingdom of man has to go. The kingdom of self, whatever it may be, when you get saved, suddenly it's no longer what I want, but it's what God wants. 
When a whole community feels and is impacted by the Spirit of God happening in its midst, things like these block parties we're going to do and all the outreaches we're going to do next month and the housing developments and all over Frankfurt, the canvassing, the backpack outreach, you will begin to see adversity and frictions and sparks flying because the kingdoms of man are going to have to make way for the kingdom of God to come on earth. And all of a sudden, what you're going to see, the fallout, the fruit, the impact, the leafing of the tree, what you will see is the kingdoms of man start to be overtaken by the kingdom of God. People's hearts are changed. The communities change. People are more open to give, more open to see what God can do in a community. People right now, man, they're working voraciously. Uh, Governor Bevin, other people in the city government, they applied for grants downtown, $10 million or whatever, to change 2nd Street. That's all good and all wonderful. But unless the kingdom of God comes, Frankfurt will always look the same. I don't care if the new buildings are there and the new edifices look nice, more people visit. What matters is that the spirit of God begins to displace the spirits of man and the spirit of the enemy that is overtaken in our cities. You want lasting change for Frankfurt? Let's pray that God will revive us. Let's pray that the Spirit of God will come and displace our hearts so that we can see the Spirit of God change and renew. The same exact thing happened when Jesus was before Pontius Pilate, Caesar's representative. It's the exact same thing. Remember, Pilate went in two directions. He said, do you have a kingdom? And Jesus says, yes, but my kingdom's not of this world. And then, and then Pilate went again. Coming back to him, he says, uh, I have power to release you. And Jesus says, you don't have any power that God hasn't given you. Jesus is reminding the governor, reminding the city, reminding the officials and the magistrates that who is really in control of this city, of this town. That's the kingdom of God coming. That's the friction of the kingdom of God coming. So, slow back a little bit, guys, just for a minute. You're making me preach wild now. I want to leave you with this thought. I want everybody to close their eyes. I know that historically this is what has happened in revivals, and I'm not trying to make anything happen. I just want you to image this, if you will. Imagine the new kingdom. Just imagine it. Imagine the kingdom of God happening in your hearts. Just close your eyes and see the wolf laying with the lamb. Imagine the child. Imagine my little son, Wilson, eight month old, playing with a cobra, (laughs) slapping him in the head, beating him on the ground. No strike, no fangs, no poison. Imagine a kingdom where that happens. Imagine, if you will, the government of Frankfurt and the government of the United States and everything's at peace because it's not the president who's sitting on the throne, but it's God who's sitting on the throne. Jesus Christ is in charge, the Prince of Peace. Imagine the earth as it's recreated. As you image this in your mind, this is is how I want to frame this. Imagine the most radical experience you've ever had with God. What it felt like, maybe when you were baptized, maybe it was communion one day, maybe it was just coming to church and worshiping, maybe you were on the altar on your knees, maybe it was when you first gave your heart to the Lord. Imagine that moment and just say, Lord, remember, help me remember that moment. Remember the first joy of my salvation. Remember when I got baptized in the Spirit, whatever that situation may be, remember that for a moment. Say, Lord, bring back to me the emotion of it, the feelings of it. I want to experience that. Are you there? Can you feel it? Now imagine that moment never, ever ending. Never going away. The feelings, the ecstasy of the kingdom of God in your hearts, never ending, never going away. That's what the kingdom of God will be like.